on the 28th of March, 2017, a group of 15 like-minded activists embarked on a mission that would challenge one of the most cruel and abhorrent aspects of the UK's immigration system, charter flights. Whilst they hoped their action would save the lives of vulnerable people, no one could have foreseen that their action would cause such an outcry amongst the top echelons of the state that they would have been charged with terror-related offences and potentially even go to prison. The case was truly unprecedented. If the Stansted 15 were punished under terror-related law for their peaceful protests, this would represent a chilling turning point in the country's noble tradition of dissent and direct action. This is the story of the Stansted 15. The Stansted 15 action was about the most brutal part of the Home Office hostile environment, uh, charter flights, which round people up in the middle of the night, snatching them from friends and family and often deporting them to places where they might not know anyone. And our action was about stopping a particular charter flight that was going to Nigeria and Ghana, where people were being forced on there against their will in really brutal conditions. The reason why we targeted a charter flight is because charter flights are the most brutal aspect of the UK hostile environment. People can be you know, swept up from the streets, literally, by teams of immigration enforcement, thrown into detention where they will spend an indefinite amount of time. There are some people in detention who've been there for years and in detention it's very, very difficult to get access to a lawyer. One of the terrible things about charter flights is that um, whatever process there is, which is pretty limited, it, it circumvents even that. So if you consider that 50% of deportation decisions are overturned on appeal, a charter flight then often removes people's ability to have an appeal because when uh, a plane is booked, it's very expensive to book a charter flight. There's then an impetus on officials to, to round people up based on perceived nationality, not even their actual nationality, to fill seats on a plane. So the appeal process at that point is often circumvented and people are put on a flight before they've had a chance to, to get access to a lawyer or, or to any chance of a hearing in the legal system. Many of these people don't have money for a private lawyer. They might not even speak the language very well. So the whole process is, well, a form of torture, really. But there are huge um, waiting lists to, to see a lawyer in, in detention, to, to see a lawyer on legal aid. And the appointments with the legal aid lawyer are only 30 minutes. And all immigration cases are very complex. It's a very complex area of law. So it, you know, it requires a, a specialist solicitor so yeah many people don't because there's such a short window from them getting a notice that they're going to be deported to actually being deported many people go through the whole detention process and are actually deported without ever having the opportunity to to speak with a legal representative before we took the action we heard testimonies from several people who were going to be deported that night and in these testimonies, we learned that there were people who feared for their lives if they were to be deported. So to tell you just one story, there was a woman who was being deported to Nigeria. She had fled Nigeria, fled her abusive ex-husband and come to live in the UK. She was lesbian uh, and she wanted to live freely in the UK as a lesbian. Um, in Nigeria, they have extremely draconian laws against gay people. And her abusive ex-husband knew that she was going to be on that particular charter flight. We think that officials had, had probably told him um, because it is such a homophobic environment in Nigeria. And he had said he was going to be waiting at the airport for her threatening to kill her. He also knew where her children were uh, with, with her sister um, and was threatening them as well. So she really couldn't return to Nigeria with, without it being a threat to her life. So it was stories like these of several people that we knew where people weren't going to be safe if they were deported that night that made us decide that, that we had to stop that flight.
So we had the testimonies with us in our bags and, you know, we were feeling quite nervous before going to do this action, which we knew would change all our lives and indeed did. So we decided to read out the testimonies, I suppose, as a way of strengthening our resolve. And as we read them, you know, I remember the words that I read, which was actually of a 21 year old man. And he said, please, can someone help us? I'm begging someone to help us. And we knew that as we were sat there on the minibus going to Stansted Airport, the people who had said these words were also sat on buses coming from detention centres across the country, most likely in shackles, in fear of their lives, also driving to Stansted Airport. So we knew that really we had to stop that flight. Well, we've seen, sadly, uh, over a number of years, that there is a clear risk to you know, the most vulnerable individuals, often torture survivors, trafficking survivors, refuse asylum seekers who may have had a very strong protection claim, but for whatever reason, often lack of legal representation, are una unable to properly ventilate their claim. So when we arrived at Stansted, we cut through the fence with, with bolt cutters, just kind of bolt cutters that we've got from a DIY centre, and then proceeded to sort of walk calmly through the hole that we'd cut. We then walked across a small piece of grass and uh, another bit of concrete to uh, Stand 505, which is effectively, it's like an airplane uh, parking lot. Um, so the, the Titan flight was, was sat there waiting to be loaded and once we saw the, the Titan flight we uh, set up a tripod at the back and used lock-ons, arm tubes uh, made of reinforced steel that you lock on with a carabiner um, that's extremely hard to remove so we some of us lay around the back of the plane around the tripod and some of us lay around the wheel of the plane also with these reinforced arm tubes which effectively meant that we couldn't be removed we were using our bodies as a kind of blockade to stop the plane leaving. So we were arrested for aggravated trespass and charged with aggravated trespass. And this was a charge that, that we thought, you know, we possibly could be, could be charged with and were kind of prepared to go to court to fight that charge, essentially. So we were originally arrested in uh, March 2017 and it was late June, early July 2017, the same year that we found out the charge had been changed. I remember it very clearly. It was a really warm day and I was uh, on my lunch break. I'd had sort of external meetings and I went to a cafe at Vauxhall to get a sandwich and logged onto my um, uh, email and discovered I had, uh, had an email from Raj, my lawyer, and it said change of charge. It mentioned Aviation and Maritime Security Act, maximum life imprisonment. And it was a, it was a very bizarre, very bizarre moment. I just remember feeling completely disorientated, just very confused because it so didn't relate to what we'd done. So the protesters were charged with an offence contrary to Section 12B of the Aviation and Maritime Security Act, 1990. The AMSA makes it an offence for any person by any means of any device, substance or weapon to disrupt the services of, of an aerodrome. And as far as we're aware, that particular offence has only been charged once before. And it was charged in relation to somebody who flew a helicopter in anger towards an airport tower in an airport, causing people in the tower to believe that they were about to be killed. It has never been charged before against peaceful protesters. I think my initial reaction was to think this is absolutely ridiculous. How can they get away with this? Like, there's no way that the Attorney General is going to um, consent to this, you know, you know, massive escalation in the charge. So I think, I think initially I wasn't as disturbed <laughs> as in retrospect I should have been, just because I thought this is, this is absolutely outrageous. So it is terror related, I mean, partly because it, it implements an international terrorism convention. It's also a crime of serious violence. If the prosecution had been correct in their construction of this offence, it would have meant that anybody who supported the Stansted 15 in their action, who 
praised them for what they did would have themselves been left open to being um, charged with a terrorism offence. In one of the most important passages of the judgment, uh, the Lord Chief said that there was, in truth, no case to answer. He said in terms that the appellants should never have been prosecuted for the very serious offence of Section 12B. The headline is that the conviction has been quashed. We have won Woo! the appeal. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm going to cry. cry. Oh my God. Are you... Oh my God. I guess, I, guess the, I guess something is to say that, you know, in the end, like we did, we did win via the appeal. Um, it was, yeah, it was a very difficult thing to go through, thinking you might go to jail um, and the stress that comes with that. But, you know, I don't regret it for a second. Um, because of our actions, 11 people are still in the country, which is, you know, an amazing thing that I think of, you know, so often. And also because of our actions, you know, I was very privileged to be part of something very special that, that did that did change things and also had a huge community uh, around it. And, you know, there were many, many moments of my Stanza 15 experience that I will treasure um, and I will take with me. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll always look back on it and be proud. The resistance to this kind of conduct by government, their lack of regard for the rule of law has many guises. And, you know, we as lawyers have to work within the law and these individuals that we represent, vulnerable people, torture victims, as I say, have benefited from other ways and, and other and ways in which people are helping. And the Stance of 15 were a really incredible, brave example of standing up to government in a way which, we, we, which we've not seen before. Despite eventually securing acquittals for the Stance of 15, as well as the Colston protesters in Bristol earlier this year, the freedom to protest is still under attack from lawmakers. Through Stansted 15, we have seen how the state would use its discretion to clamp down on protest. The government are planning to introduce their draconian police, crime, sentencing and courts bill, which would severely deter any form of protest by criminalising those that are deemed too disruptive, too noisy, and would allow police to stop and search protesters without any suspicion of criminal activity. So whilst justice was achieved in the story of the Stansted 15, it's important to recognize that the age old right to protest is still very much under threat.